So I suppose there's no getting around it. Um, this is a hard passage. And not, uh, not in the way that some passages are, are hard, right? Where it's, uh, where it's hard to follow what's going on, or there's maybe some difficult theology or history or, or something like that to, to wrap our heads around. Um, this is not a hard passage because it's hard to understand what Jesus is saying. This is a hard passage precisely because it's not hard to understand what Jesus is saying. This, um, this is the sort of passage that keeps me up at night. So uh, just a warning. Uh, my goal this morning is to give all of us something to keep us up at night. So let's set the stage. Last week, Jesus called his first disciples. Simon, James, and John. And between then and now, between last week's passage and, and this week's, they've, they've continued uh, in his work. Uh, they've, they've gone around with Jesus as Jesus has, has healed lepers and paralytics. He's spoken words of forgiveness. Questions and concerns of, about blasphemy have begun among some of the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus has called more disciples. So grumblings have begun about the sort of people that he's eating and drinking with. He's healed people and been accused of doing it at the wrong time and in the wrong way by some of the leaders in the community. Jesus has been healing and teaching and calling and inviting and forgiving. And while this, is, this has drawn some, some of this concern from certain leaders and authorities, by and large, more and more people are now following him. The crowds are growing. And just before our passage for this morning, Jesus has gone up to, up, to, up to a mountain to pray. And the next day, he called to his disciples, the whole group of them. And then out of, out of that group of disciples, and we, we don't know how many there were at that point. Uh, it's apparently a decent-sized number. Uh, out of all of his disciples, he chooses 12 to be what he calls his apostles. From the word apostolus, which means uh, someone who is sent. And these are the 12 that, that Jesus is going to really invest in uh, very intimately over the next, the next few years, preparing them to be the leaders in this new thing that, that, Jesus, that Jesus is beginning here. So now, here we are. From the mountain, Jesus comes down with them to a level plain. In Matthew's Gospel account, Jesus preaches a sermon, uh, similar, but there's differences, uh, preaches a sermon on the mountain. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Well, here in Luke, Jesus preaches a sermon on a plain, on level ground. These are two different sermons that have, they have a lot in common, but there's some differences, too. So they come down from the mountain and stand there on that level plain with all these crowds of people from all over, Jews and Gentiles who had come come to hear and to be healed. All these people, troubled and in need, far, far and away, these are, these are primarily not the, not the well-to-do and well-connected, but the ones who maybe are just trying to make it day to day. And this crowd, it's not what we would call a polite crowd, staying, you know, a nice, respectful distance. This is a crowd that pushes in, reaching out, touching and grabbing at Jesus, hoping for just a bit of of his power and healing with even the slightest touch. Right, if only I could just touch him, right? Imagine, um, imagine maybe I don't, I don't know, uh, the Beatles trying to make their way in and out of the uh, Ed Sullivan Show Theater, right? right? Just grabbing and reaching. And it's in the midst of this, all this chaos going on, these, these crowds that are pressing in, reaching out, touching and grabbing him. And Jesus looks up looks up from the crowd and at his disciples, and he says, Blessed are you who are poor. Yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of me. Rejoice! Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, for surely, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for that's what they did to the prophets. Then, 
kind of hear the, hear the pause as, as Jesus takes a breath. Woe to you who are rich. You have already received your consolation, your comfort. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you. That's what they did to the false prophets. Blessed are you who are poor. Woe to you who are rich. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Woe to you who are full now. Blessed are you who are weeping. Woe to you who are laughing. Blessed are you who are hated, excluded, reviled, and defamed. <coughs> Woe to you who are well spoken of and well thought of. Let's be clear. Jesus is not giving advice here. He is not urging or giving an exhortation on, on how to act or, or what to do to be, to be blessed, to get blessed. Or to get something, what to do to get something good or to avoid something bad. He's not giving commands to do this, to do this or not do that. Or even, he's not even making moral judgments on those who, who fall into either of these categories. Which is important for us to get because passages like this have been and are used in that way. As an excuse to justify not doing anything to alleviate po poverty, hunger, persecution, or, or whatever, or to, or to somehow minimize the plight of those that are any of these things. No, that's not what's going on here. Jesus is simply announcing a fact, proclaiming a truth aimed right into the heart of this world and into us. Not a recommended action plan, just a fact about how things are. <coughs> And so for those of us, like me, who like much more of a, a strategic plan of, of lists and action steps with the, uh, with the end result there of being blessed, right? who like a checklist to, to, to get that goal of blessedness, or at least a checklist to, to get to where you avoid woe-ness, right? nobody wants that. This is unsettling, because Jesus is not giving us plan or commands or things to do. He is just here saying, hey, this is me just telling you how it is. And if that were not unnerving or uneasy enough, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. But here, he just says, blessed are the poor and woe to the rich. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But here in the Sermon on the Plain, down here on level ground, he just says, Blessed are the hungry and woe to the full. I don't know about you, but I am much more comfortable with his lofty Sermon on the Mount than his Sermon down here on the Plain. First of all, because what Jesus is saying is simply outrageous. But it's just that over the centuries, perhaps, it's easy for us to have lost that. There's more to it than this, but, but one way to think of, think of blessed are you is congratulations. Congratulations, you're poor. Congratulations, you're hungry. Congratulations, you're weeping and despised and slandered. Oh, how unfortunate for you. You are up to date on your mortgage, you've got money in the bank, and your 401k is doing well. How unfortunate for you that your belly and your refrigerator is full. How unfortunate for you that you're generally having a good time. And how unfortunate it is that everybody actually likes you. I'm so sorry to hear that. That is outrageous. And that is hard for us to hear. And not only because it just doesn't make sense, but because the reality is, I don't know about you, but that second list, that describes me way more accurately than the first. 
And it certainly describes what I want out of life way more than the first. Especially when I don't try to merge this sermon on the plain into that other sermon on the mount. Because, because in the latter, up there on the mountain, no less true and no less piercing, but at least there Jesus focuses more on, on an abstract spiritual sense of poverty and hunger. But here, Jesus doesn't give us that nuance or that caveat of, of in spirit or, or for righteousness. He just leaves it as poor hungry. All the meaning of those words in their everyday sense spoken there in the midst of those crowds that are pressing in. So what do we do with this? What do we do with the unease that this really should provoke in us and rattle around in our souls and in our very being? Right? Sign me up for being blessed, but not for being poor hungry, or disliked, and slandered, and sad. And I don't want any of those woes showing up, but the truth is, I really like a full fridge, laughter, praise, and the security of money in the bank. The truth is, I am deeply <coughs> uneasy with a blessedness like this. So I don't know about you, my first inclination is to start to think, you know, Jesus, if this is the type of stuff that you're going to go around and say, well, I think maybe your home congregation back in Nazareth, they may have been on to something. But it didn't work for them. I don't, I'm not sure that'll work for us. So what do we do with this? Jesus is speaking among the crowds many of whom no doubt were poor, were hungry, had much in life to mourn over, and, and who were probably not well thought of. He's speaking to his disciples, not just to the twelve, but to all his disciples. He's looking at them when he proclaims the truth, the truth of these blessings and woes. He's making statements about the present and the future. You who are poor, yours is the kingdom of God. Not, not just a future inheritance, but it is here in the present yours. But you who are hungry and who weep now, in the present, you will, in the future, be filled and you will lack. You who are rich, you have already, already, here in the present, received your consolation. You who are full now, who are laughing now, here in the present, you will be in the future, hungry, and mourning, and weeping. As it, as it so often is when Jesus preaches and, and teaches, especially about the kingdom of God, present and future become all tangled up. Jesus has just called his disciples and his apostles, these followers of him whose, whose mission is to proclaim the gospel, the very good news of the kingdom of God that Jesus has come to bring. That's what Jesus is talking about here, the kingdom. He's talking about this both present and future, this both already and not yet reign of God that is found in him. And he is saying that the priorities of this kingdom, what is true about his kingdom, the places where you find this kingdom sprouting up and making inroads into this life, into this world, it is completely opposite and other than what you think, and maybe even than what you want. And at the very least, and I mean the very least, Jesus is saying, so be careful. Be very careful about becoming full and happy and admired. Be very careful very careful of playing that game of looking for and seeking out praise. I think he's also saying more than that. Again, Jesus is not imparting moral judgments here. But he knows very well that we do, right? Jesus just simply states that the kingdom reality, that he states the kingdom reality that blessed are you who are poor and hungry. 
we who find ourselves wondering, hmm, maybe that family on food stamps is trying to game the system. It's we who say, maybe that person on the street corner, maybe if they had just made better choices. Jesus just simply states the kingdom reality that blessed are you who weep now. It's we who find ourselves thinking, well, maybe if they had more, or better faith, they'd be a little more joyful and a whole lot more enjoyable to be around. Jesus is here just simply stating the kingdom reality that blessed are you who are excluded and defamed and looked down upon we who find ourselves saying, yeah, their unpopularity may rub off on me if I get too close. The hard truth is that Jesus is saying this right here with the poor, the hungry, the mourning, the weep, weeping, the forgotten and ignored, the disliked and defamed, the ones who are by our standards and the standards of this world completely vulnerable and at risk physically, emotionally, socially, the hard, scandalous truth is that this is who the kingdom of God is bent toward and drawn to. This is who has priority and top billing in God's kingdom. And so if nothing else, Jesus is giving us, he is laying out the facts in order to give us a stark choice where to stand, who to stand with. Asking each of us, and asking all of us, this is where the kingdom is, this is where God's heart is turned. And so the implicit question to all who are rich, to all who are not hungry, to all who are more often than not laughing rather than weeping, to all who are well thought of, the implicit question in all of this is, okay, fine. But given all of that, now, where are you going to stand? And to whom are you going to stand with? Because this here is a pointed reminder that the values that undergird the kingdom of God are so very different, so very other than the values that run through life as we know it and so often life as we live it. Blessed are you are poor. Woe to you who are rich. <clears throat> Blessed are you who are hungry now. Woe to you who are full now. Blessed are you who are weeping. Woe to you who are laughing. Blessed are you who are hated, excluded, reviled, and defamed. Woe to you who are well spoken of and well thought of. There's no getting around it. If this does not make us uneasy, we are not hearing it. Because Jesus is right here saying the kingdom of God should make you uneasy. It should collide headlong with this world and make an uneasy mess. It should challenge what you thought you knew, what we thought the best life was. And even what we think is a sure sign of God at work, it should completely upend and even disorient how we see the world. And so maybe, maybe a place to start, not to finish, but to start, is to hear in these profoundly uneasy claims about blessedness, maybe it's to hear they are screaming to us the truth that there should be. There better be a blessed uneasiness, a holy unease with all of our unquestioned and assumed and liked and enjoyed values and priorities and systems of this world. That to follow Jesus is to be uneasy with not just the ways of this world, even with our own place in it. As Jesus tells us precisely where God's heart is, where it is turned, and to 
whom God's heart is turned toward. So I suspect that this bit of, of Jesus' sermon is a far harder message for us to hear than perhaps many in the crowds on that day. I suspect that amidst those crowds that day out there on that, on that level ground, I suspect that for many this came as the best possible news, even though for us it probably comes with a bit of judgment. And so I confess that I still don't know fully what to do with this. Except to confess that I am rich. My refrigerator is full. Life is more often enjoyable and easy for me than not. And if I may say so, I am not reviled or hated or excluded, even on account of Jesus. It's to confess that then to ask God to help me be uneasy with the easiness that I have found in life. And then to trust, to trust in this Jesus of Nazareth who came, not just to teach, but to heal. To perhaps heal eyes and a heart rarely sees things as God sees them. And that so often prioritizes and loves and strives after the wrong things. And to trust Jesus, and he says it matters where you choose to stand, where you align yourselves, and who you choose to stand with. Rich or the poor, the full or the hungry, the joyful and laughing, sad and weeping, the popular and well-esteemed, and the despised and mocked. And if that makes us uneasy, if that keeps us up for a bit at night, I suspect that's probably a good thing, and a good first step. So let's pray. Lord, for, for words that are not easy to hear, but true nonetheless, we give you thanks. Help us to hear your word, your word spoken on that level ground all those years ago. Help us to hear it. Help us to receive it. Help us to wrestle with it. Help it to change us, that we might find ourselves more and more aligned with your kingdom and the values of your kingdom, that our eyes and hearts may be opened to wrestling with this uneasy but so very good news of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen.